tricep, skull crusher, mistakes and how to fix them. We've got Joey Satmary of Sat Strength on YouTube. Check out his channel. It's probably better than this one, to be completely honest. But while we have him, he's gonna show us how to skull crush wrong, possibly dying in the process, and how to do it right, possibly becoming immortal. Let's get into the first mistake and how to correct it. Just to clear something up, this isn't so much a mistake, but a very, very important uh, sort of theoretical basis to place before we talk about skull crushers. There's actually two different, pretty different variations of skull crusher, and neither one of them is right or wrong. They just do slightly different things. Option number one is the behind the head skull crusher, which ideally you would touch the bench behind you and come all the way up. Joey, can you show us that one real quick? So normal technique, elbows stay in, he's gonna go behind his head, gently touch the bench for a standard range of motion and come all the way up and then repeat it one more time just for technique purposes. So that's option number one. Okay, and then without racking, Joey, show us option number two. This one, you touch down to roughly around your nose is a good start. Some people can even do the chin, some people it's the forehead, but it's not the behind the head version, it's the actual face crusher version. Go ahead and rack, Joey, that's good enough. So which one of those is right or wrong? Neither, they just do something slightly different, so here's how to use them. If you wanna hit the back of your tricep a little bit more, hit the long head, then you can do the skull crushers that touch behind yourself if your shoulders and elbows feel okay with it. For some folks, that causes either a bit of uh, shoulder discomfort or often a lot of elbow discomfort, and they'll write the skull crusher off completely as being like, I can't do this, it hurts my elbows. I used to be one of those people. The thing is, Hitting long head happens with every single pulling exercise you do and standing overhead uh, tricep extensions hit that even better than this exercise does. But this is still a great option if you like it, if you feel it in your tricep, super awesome, use it away. The other option where you bend at your elbows, keeping them close together and you touch somewhere on your face is totally cool. It actually stretches your tricep a bit more towards the distal end totally fine to do as well if that feels better, if you get better tricep pumps from it, if you get a better perception of tension in your triceps, if you get a better burn, that's the one you can be using and you can always use both. Just label them as different exercises, do a few months of one and a few months of the other. So when folks say, well, you know, you're touching your face, that's not a skull crusher, it sure as hell is. Some people get it confused with the JM press. The skull crusher is when you come straight up and down, but you're touching somewhere on your face. The JM press is usually when you touch your chin or really sort of go into your neck area, and then you don't press straight up, you press up and forward. It's a hybrid between a close grip bench and a skull crusher to your face. So that's a JM press. Different exercise, also a really good one, not the topic of this video, but yes, touching your face is still a skull crusher. You don't have to go behind your head. Both are totally fine. First mistake in the skull crusher, once you've picked a variation you like, is using a partial range of motion. Okay, the uh, oftentimes what people do with skull crushers is they end up getting into a middle range of motion and doing these little pump reps. Go ahead, uh, Joey, and show us what's going on there. So they're gonna go down and up, sort of like, yeah, get a good tricep pump, but they're missing out. What are they missing out on? Two things. One, full motor unit recruitment to make sure that, you know, extending your elbows forcefully recruits a whole lot more motor units in your triceps than just this middle range. And going all the way down for a deep stretch stretches the muscle under tension, which itself produces lots of hypertrophy. There is at least one study on skull crushers that shows slightly better results in the higher rep range from a group that did the weird partials versus a full range of motion group. I would not invest heavily into one study. On all the other muscles of the body, every other study pretty much shows that full range of motion is better than partials. You don't wanna be the person that bases their whole training philosophy on one quirky study that doesn't make a whole lot of sense anyway, only to have another study come out and refuse that one and then you're left holding your own nuts like usual. So our best bet here is absolutely to do a full range of motion. Now, if you don't lock out completely and rest between reps, you can get a baller metabolite effect, which is what they attributed the results of the study to, but you can still for sure go all the way down and just stop just short of lockout and then go all the way back down. Show us what that looks like real quick, Joey. So instead of doing super partials, you can do all the way down, gently touch your nose, and come all the way almost to lockout, and then right back down without a pause. So do it sort of a little quicker, Joey, and right back down. 
and then up and right back down. Perfect. That's a ton of metabolite stuff. That's option number one. Hold the bar for a second. Option number two, if you really want to crank the metabolites in skull crushers, is actually to use the lockout and rest. So you're going to do a set where you're going to barely lock out and then you're going to take a break right there and breathe for a couple of reps. So Joey, pretend to do a, uh, you know, a couple reps, partial lock. So full range of motion. And then let's say he gets really tired. He's almost a failure. Lock out take two or three deep breaths, metabolites are still cooking, and then you go again for another little mini set. That will allow you to get way more reps, good enough, perfect, you can rack. That way you can get way more repetitions, you can fry your triceps with metabolites, so what you might not wanna do is a set where you go all the way down and lock and rest, and all the way down and lock and rest, and all the way down and lock and rest. That's really good from a tension perspective, but maybe the metabolite response isn't as great, the hypoxia isn't as great, you won't get as much. So what I recommend is to do skull crushers in a sort of organic fashion, full range, just don't milk the lockout a ton, and then when you're resting, breathe, 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 and do it again, and then again, and then again, until you really can't do any more then rack. That's a mega, super awesome set. That's a, a coin term, by the way. Once you've got that going, you're going to get awesome tricep pumps, awesome activation, and you still get that awesome, awesome full range of motion. The next mistake in skull crushers, just like with many exercise, is an uncontrolled eccentric, uncontrolled descent. Remember, the eccentric contraction slowing against gravity, resisting gravity, provides an awesome muscle growth stimulus. And it keeps you safer for two reasons. One, you're less likely to get in any joint trouble by having to reverse the weight super quick make it under uh, more slow and control. And two, it's a fucking skull crusher. If you really dive bomb these things, you're going to break your face sooner or later. You may already be considerably unattractive, just like me. But for the love of God, facial reconstructive surgery still costs lots of money. Folks, think about the economy. Joey, show us what a dive bomb skull crusher looks like. Hopefully he doesn't die doing this. So whoop, and then press and then sort of and then press. And really the big problem is he misses out on that eccentric contraction. It's less challenging this way. Now show us what a real good scar pressure looks like. Doesn't mean it's super slow. Notice it only takes him about one or two seconds to go all the way down, but he's always in control. That literally means more muscle growth stimulus. Perfect. The next mistake, very related to range of motion problems, is not having a consistent range of motion. Almost all of your skull crushers should go to a fully locked out or very close position and come all the way down. Generally, you want to either touch your nose or if you're doing the behind the head version, touch the actual uh, bench behind you or at least some landmark, like some part of your skull that you know it's the same one every time. That way you can track your reps better, you can apply overload better, and you can know if you're making progress versus just being like, yeah, I got 12 reps last week. I'm not really sure if it's really like as good as the 12 I did this week because I sort of cut some of the range of motion on some of the reps. What does this look like in real life? Joey, fuck it all up for us and do some weird skull crushers that are uh, some, yeah, some are low, some are high. Who the hell knows? A good skull crusher like Joey's doing now, Hit it now with the right, <laughs> that was really awful. So Joey can fix this problem by simply saying to himself two things. One, I'm gonna lock up my elbows every single time and I'm gonna touch my nose every single time. Go ahead and hit it all the way up and all the way down, perfect. And now there's no question about how many reps to count, how to apply overload. Joey, show us the version where you touch uh, all the way down to the bench. So if you're doing the skull crushers behind your head, touch the bench every time and come up. Don't sit on that bench. Keep the tension, gently touch, come all the way up. Perfect. Good enough. And then you know how many reps you did. You know how to apply progressive overload. The next mistake on skull crushers is letting your elbows flare a ton, especially on the way down. It's okay if your elbows flare a little bit on the way up because you're just trying to get that weight up as much as you can and you get a ton of tricep activation doing it, but especially on the way down, you want to tuck your elbows in so it's basically almost all triceps and not a ton of chest and front delt. This is intentionally an isolation exercise. Is it okay to flare your triceps out if you feel your triceps more that way? 100% yes. But if you're flaring out only to get more reps because your pecs can help, that's really violating the purpose of the exercise, which is to make it a specific exercise for the tricep. And look, there's nothing wrong with getting your chest involved, but that's what dips are for. That's what close grip benches are for. That's what JM presses are for. In skull crushers, we keep the elbows as close to the body as we can. Now, here's the thing. Joey's a fucking jack dude. He's not going to be able to bring it. I can't fucking bring my elbows in super close. So it doesn't have to be your elbows enough to go straight vertical, but bring them in as much as you can flush to your body, especially on the way down. Joey, show us what a, the wrong version looks like here. So people do skull crushers and they'll sort of 
Yeah, and even if you go to your nose, sometimes they'll just let the elbows go way out. And that really honestly just lets you use your chest more. You can do more reps, you can do more weight, but you're not here to train your chest. To train your triceps, you wanna put your elbows in, see that rotation, and then you go down under control. It's always going to be tempting to let your elbows flare. A couple more, Joey. It's always gonna be tempting for your elbows to come out on the way up, resist, especially on the way down. Make sure you're doing these right so that they hit your triceps and not much else. All right, the next mistake is to think that some grips or some bars or even dumbbells are better or worse on a sort of blanket level than some others. People will say, what grip do you recommend for skull crushers? I only have really one answer, one in which you feel your triceps to be really well stimulated, tons of tension, tons of burn, tons of pump and tons of, tons of disruption after the session, and one in which your shoulders and elbows and so on and so forth don't accrue a lot of damage and don't hurt a ton. So basically a very comfortable grip or hand position or even different kind of bar, because you can use an easy bar, you can use a straight bar, you can use dumbbells in one that really allows you to work your triceps while keeping your pecs and front delts and everything else a little bit more out of the movement. It's super different for everyone. Joey could be the guy that does wide grip skull crushers. Joey, go ahead and grab with a slight wide grip and like pretend that's something that works for you. <laughs> so he could do skull crushers with a wide grip and apparently like he's, you know, he's doing them and I ask him, hey, does that feel fucking super weird on your shoulders or elbows? And he feels, no, he says, no, it feels great. And, but the triceps feel amazing and they're getting a really great pump, really great tension. I can't dog him for that. Or try a super close grip version, Joey, real quick. You can be one of these guys that does a close grip and all of a sudden you feel a great stimulus in your triceps and your joints feel good. That's not gonna be the same for everyone. He could replace it with dumbbells or an easy bar. Here's another cool trick. Some people feel better with their thumb looped with the bar and some people with a false grip. And there's no problem doing one or the other. If I loop my shit, my elbows fry out for no reason, they just start hurting. I have no idea why, but honestly don't give a shit because for me, when I do the suicide grip or the thumbless grip, everything feels 100% fine. It's really up to you to find out what works best for you. There's no dogma here. There's no optimal grip for skull crushers. It's what stimulates your muscles the best while expending the least amount of fatigue and involvement of other muscles. A quick tip and possibly a mistake if you're doing the wrong thing here is where to initiate the movement. For some folks, if they initiate at the elbows, elbows sort of break first, it feels really good for them, really great mind-muscle connection for the tricep, no elbow pain, no shoulder pain. For other folks, if they do that, they're in hideous pain. And for them, it's better to start moving back first and then break at the elbows. There's no correct answer here that I know of. You just have to experiment and figure out what you're doing. What I would say is don't just blindly skull crush, get elbow pain and not know which one. Because if you come up to me on the street randomly and you say, hey, you know, skull crush has hurt my elbows, what should I do? I'll ask you, where do you initiate the movement? And if you have no idea what that means, or you've never tried it, you won't be able to help yourself a ton. So Joey, show us real quick, Here's how we initiate movement at the elbow. So if, if Joey wants to initiate movement at the elbow, he's gonna go forward with his elbows towards his tummy and then his shoulders flex and then he goes all the way down, just like that. Alternatively, he could still touch his nose but push his shoulders back first and then break at the elbows and then touch his nose. Same, similar, very, very similar looking movement but the initiation really does matter. Go ahead and rack. Similar idea almost identical idea with squats. Some people will squat by pushing their hips back first and then bending their knees. Some people have no problem keeping their hips locked and bending the knees down. And a lot of folks, it's a simultaneous movement that really both are going at the same time. Some people will really prefer one versus another and there's honestly no super correct answer as far as hypertrophy training is concerned. So for these skull crushers, play around with bending first at the elbows or first at the shoulders or even a bit between. Figure out which one works best for you, not just from a mind-muscle connection perspective, but also from a how well your shoulders and elbows are taking it perspective. And for a lot of folks, literally me included, once I started breaking at the elbows first and then bending, I rediscovered that skull crushers were an awesome exercise for me after a decade of not doing them because I thought they had to hurt my elbows because I was always breaking backwards. Give it a shot, see how you feel. Last tip and mistake for skull crushers is going too heavy or too light. As long as you're getting a great burn in your triceps, as long as your pec and shoulder stability isn't what's sort of making you give out, there's really no such thing as too high of reps. Anywhere between sets of 10 
and all the way up to sets of 30 is totally fine. I would save 20 to 30 reps for cable stuff because I feel like it works better and you can actually isolate the muscle more. I think skull crushers for sets of much over 20 reps, you, you start to get more stabilizer fatigue than tricep fatigue itself. Sometimes the forearms start to cramp up and give out, so on and so forth. So ideally, I think for most people, skull crushers are best done in the 10 to 20 rep range. What about the five to 10 rep range? Well, when you think about it, fundamentally, it's an isolation movement. The five to 10 rep range for isolation is tough, right? It can uh, honestly lead to some elbow pain, some shoulder pain, technique can start to break down because in the five to 10 rep range, you're so focused on pushing the weight, which you should be, that the technique might not go out the window, but become less of a priority. And all of a sudden, someone's like, hey, how was that set for your triceps? And you're like, I don't know. I was just kind of trying to press the weight, right? That's not really what you want, but there's a hidden gem in there. When you say, I was just trying to press the weight, we do tons of presses in our chest training and you can do close grip bench and that stuff works great in the five to 10 rep range. So remember, we have a ton of other exercises that use tricep. Every pushing movement uses your triceps. And if you do close grip benches, for example, or incline close grip benches, or even just regular benches, a lot of that overhead presses are great. Sets of five to 10 are awesome on those and they do absolutely require your triceps to contract super hard, getting an excellent heavy stimulus. So if you're doing heavy pressing, especially with closer grips, that's part of your tricep and chest training, and even your shoulder training, don't worry about having to go heavy on skull crushers. The skull crushers almost then sort of relegated to the higher rep work for which they are more ideal. So my personal advice is for sure, anywhere between five and 30 rep sets are totally fine, but your elbows uh, especially might not like sets of five to 10 on skull crushers and your mind muscle connection might not be that great. Sets of 20 to 30, you might just generally fatigue or other muscles like your forearms might get in the way. Your triceps won't be a limiting factor anymore. So I would say sets of 10 to 20 are probably best for movement like skull crushers, but don't worry, your heavy work will still be there for your triceps coming in from heavy close grip pressing at a variety of angles, including shoulder pressing and your light work probably best reserved for things like cable extensions, overhead cable extensions, rope pushdowns, so on and so forth. Folks, that's it for skull crushers. No dogma, like I always say, Use whichever tips you find useful for yourself. Always be mindful of how much fatigue you're taking, how much joint pain, how much systemic fatigue you feel. Adjust your execution to that. Always be mindful of stimulus. Are you feeling the tension where you're supposed to? Are you feeling the burn for higher ups where you're supposed to? Are you getting a pump in the target muscle or somewhere else? And do you feel disrupted in the target muscle after a session? Does it feel weak? Does it feel shaky? Does it potentially get a little bit sore? If all those things are good, then you're probably doing the right technique right? If you have questions, shoot them into the comments below. And if you have answers, if you want to help your fellow YouTuber, shoot the answers in the comments below, get a good discussion going. And lastly, if you have some exercises we haven't done yet, you should scroll back through some of our earlier uh, uh, videos in the series, and you'll see that we've done a whole bunch of exercises so far. But if we haven't gotten to an exercise you really want to see, maybe we will throw some suggestions in the comments. We'll try to do a video eventually about every single exercise we do in the comments. Unless it's a really stupid exercise, then you're a stupid person. Stop commenting, close your computer. Folks, see you next time.